Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. It's the November 13th meeting of the Shelburne Board of School Directors. Uh, first item is 2.0 adjustments to the agenda. Uh, the only adjustment that I have, and it's really very minor, is um, we are going to have an executive session tonight, um, and I guess we can call it 10.3. Um, which would be to discuss a personnel matter. Uh, we would also also be discussing negotiations and a legal matter. Uh, so, any other adjustments that we're aware of? Could we uh, could we just have a short conversation about the mechanics of what Tim and I talked about today, which would be using the fund balance? Um, that can be part of the facilities conversation. Okay. We, we are going to have a, a report to the board on that. That's part. Um, but okay. I think that also will become part of the budget. Yeah, I don't want to have a conversation about the issue, just the mechanics of it. That's all. Which is fine in the facilities report. So, so when you're talking about the mechanics, you're talking about um, how we would use fund balance? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's all. sure, uh, we can make that 6.2 a, a, a discussion matter. Because uh, that, that actually was something um, we as part of the SU meeting discussed uh, the, the audits that were recently completed and uh, there was a discussion of the Shelburne fund balance and we can we can do that so that would be 6.2 a discussion of the fund balance uh, anything else okay next is audience and communication and I think our audience this evening is all part of 4.0 which would be the K-2 academic <laughs> program uh, so um, actually, if you would like to join us at the table, and maybe he can get you on camera and all that. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we used to have more room in, in our old room. Where, uh, <laughs> come, come, come. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, can we go ahead and start? Yeah. Okay. So we do have a presentation tonight, and before we begin, I do want to um, thank all of our triple E through second grade teachers who helped to create this presentation. So with us tonight, I'll just go ahead and do introductions, are um, Jensa Bushy, and I'll further introduce Jensa in a moment, but Jensa Bushy, our literacy, literacy coordinator, Nancy Knackley, one of our one-two looping teachers who loops with Deb Kilkelly, who just arrived. They're on a team, and Gretchen Garvey is currently a second grade, she's also a one-two looping teacher in a second grade right now, and Deb is teaching second grade, and Nancy's teaching first grade in the loop. Okay. Can we turn this on? Please. Thank you. We think it's going to work. It takes a minute to warm up. It's great technology, great sound, so we appreciate that. There we go. Okay, so as that's warming up a bit, um, I do want to also express thanks to both Jensa and John Madden for all their help with this. What we're going to do is a presentation on our academic indicators and how Shelburne Community School is progressing on these from our triple E through second grades. And up here on our slide is our mission statement. And this does serve as a guidepost for the academic indicators that the board has created, um, ensuring that our students develop into citizens who learn actively and collaboratively, think creatively and critically, live responsibly and respectfully, contribute positively to their community, and pursue excellence in their individual interests. The next slide, actually developed a bit by um, Elaine and then modified by us a tad bit, um, talks about that from our mission, we have outcomes that take the form of, and in the first circle there, our action plans, of which you can see some of them up there, and then to our program or instructional focus, which are our CSSU programs. Not included up there, but very important is our school improvement plan, or what ended up from our AYP um, development last year. And all of these services increasing academic achievement for our students, as well as, of course, behavioral, social, and emotional achievement. But tonight's presentation does focus on academic achievement. And we will specifically be talking tonight about literacy, mathematics, and science. 
So as I said before, at this point, um, Jensen Bush is going to do a piece of this presentation on literacy. And so thank you very much, Jensa. You're welcome. So literacy in grades, kindergarten through second, is the foundation really for all future academic growth. So a lot of what I'm going to present to you tonight will show that to you. Academic growth in math, science, and social studies all begins and really finds its roots in the literacy that we do kindergarten through second grade. So throughout kindergarten and second grade, one consistent thread that we have is the Foundations Program. And the Foundations Program is a program that instructs students in phonemic awareness in kindergarten specifically. Word study, that's all that runs through all three, kindergarten, first, and second grade. They learn in word study phonetic skills as well as high frequency sight words. And basically all of those three things develop students' fluency with reading, vocabulary development, and they begin to apply strategies to understand text because those are really the three things that are the foundation for reading is meaning, which is why we want to have them read is really to build meaning. So that's the next line there that basically all of those allow successful reading comprehension. Also, Foundations teaches the foundational skills of handwriting, so they get direct instruction in handwriting. Cursive as well as print cursive starts in third grade. Foundations is also used in third grade in Shelburne now too, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the three through five presentation when I come for that night. And they also get rules for spelling, capitalization, punctuation, all those smaller editing skills in Foundations too. So that's one part of our reading and spelling program. Go ahead to the next slide, yeah. So next uh, are the learning outcomes at the end of each grade level. These are the kinds of things that we would expect for kindergarten, first, and second grade. In kindergarten, know all letter names and sounds, short and long vowels, really heavy emphasis more on the short vowels in kindergarten. We ask that at the end of kindergarten, students read and comprehend at text level C, which I'll talk more about in some future slides, so that you can know really what text level C would look like. And for spelling, it's mostly three-letter words, and we ask them to spell some irregular words like A, the, common, those high-frequency words by the end of kindergarten as well. First grade, they'll read at text level J. I'll show you that in a few minutes what that might look like at first grade. Spelling, you're talking in first grade things um, such as four letter words, consonant vowel, vowel consonant words, consonant um, blends at the beginning, so that would be consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant types of words, and magic E words. We focus on digraphs in first grade, blends, SHCH, blends at the beginning like BL and blends at the end, NT as well as proper grammar for sentences, capitals for na people, names of people, places, and dates. And then second grade, and that's on the next slide, we want them to read and comprehend at text level M, and I'll show you that again in a minute, and identify six syllable types. That's a really big part of the second grade foundations program is learning different types of syllables. That helps them spell multisyllabic words or words of more than one type. Base words, suffixes, prefixes, 200 read and spell high frequency words. So you can see some real growth here in second grade and then beginning dictionary skills are a focus as well. We also in second grade talk a lot more or the students learn a lot more about reading comprehension. So they might be learning to ask and answer questions, begin to analyze narrative story structure, character setting, main events. A lot of that foundation begins in first grade and kindergarten where they first learn what story structure is and it builds up to second grade. We focus on informational text, text features, kids learning about headings and titles and subtitles. That's part of the instruction and the academic outcomes, as well as connections across multiple and multi-paragraph text. We also, in second grade, uh, work on reading fluency. This begins in first grade, too. In second grade, it's a real emphasis. We want kids reading fluency includes all the dimensions of rate, expression, intonation, um, stopping in appropriate places, using your punctuation correctly as you read. And so we expect that uh, second graders at the end of the year can read about 90 words per minute with fluency and understanding. So we do have some assessments to measure this progress. For the uh, foundations, we have unit tests at the end of each unit. We have a test, and can you click on, I, I brought some examples, or I um, linked some examples in, yeah, on the foundations unit test. If you link, yep. 
it will take you to some examples so you can see the difference. So a kindergarten assessment at the end of a unit might look something like this. It's a one-on-one -on -one assessment this time of year in kindergarten. I um, really focused on this time of the year where students in this section, they would be correctly identifying lowercase letters and giving sounds to those lowercase letters. You'll see, I'm gonna show a video of students doing some of that work in a few minutes. They might also, you say the sound and the student has to identify the letter. This next section is, um, they form letters. So if you scroll down a little bit, Patty, you'll see, um, I worked with a student and he was forming some letters and you see how many letters at this time of the year they can form correctly because they have that handwriting instruction as part of foundations. If you scroll down, you'll see the first grade. I was really focusing on showing the progression and how kids grow through time, over time, so that you can see um, the difference between kindergarten first and second. So this is a unit test. This time of year, first grade, you can see those CVC words. These are sounds that they've mastered. Um, and if you keep scrolling down, you'll see on the next page, they start to begin to work on these high frequency, what they call trick words and sentences, so they start to write those simple kinds of sentences with punctuation and capital letters. And then in second grade, an assessment would look like this. So you can see the sounds become more complex that they need to master, they're glued together, so more than one sound. And um, again, these trick words and high frequency words, the blends, and then the sentences as well. So that would be a second grade end of unit assessment from this time of year. We also have another assessment that we use. It's called the BAS, that's what you'll hear teachers call it. That's short for the Benchmark Assessment System. It's really an assessment that gives us the whole picture of uh, what a reader does. This is where the text levels come from that I mentioned before. And if you click on that, I, and I brought some examples too so you can see how we would assess reading. The colored books look much prettier than what I was able to scan in. <laughs> So this would be a kindergarten, end of kindergarten level text. And you can see that this is a level C at the end of kindergarten. It's one simple predictable pattern book. And you're, you read them a little introduction about what's gonna happen. And then the students read the book so there's a small amount of text and a picture. So the student reads the whole book to you and the teacher has a recording form that looks like this. And Patty, I scanned these in if you scroll down too. So they're bigger where we record their oral reading and we're able to record words they read correctly and also um, words that are errors and over here we track their error patterns. So we keep track of their oral reading in this assessment. In the end you come out with an accuracy rate, how accurate were they with their reading, a fluency score, how well are they reading in phrases and chunks and with expression. We're also able to evaluate their comprehension. So if school, there's a conversation that you have with prompts so you're able to evaluate if the child is comprehending the text as well. And there's an optional writing about reading assessment so you can get a picture of the child's writing to, related to the text as well. And then in first grade, so that's the end of kindergarten, what we would expect. In first grade, this is a level J. Go down a little bit more, you'll see that. You can see that the text is now more and the pictures are smaller. And a lot of times the pictures don't give you nearly as many clues as to what's happening in the text. You have to have stronger decoding skills. And again, we keep track of their oral reading. They read it out loud to us so we can track their error patterns and see the strategies they're using to attack words. Fluency. And then at the end of first grade, we also will expect that they'll have, uh, we take their rate, a words per minute goal. So we begin that process of looking at them being able to read at an efficient rate. So that's an additional thing we do at the end of first. and the end of second grade, a text might look like this. So it will be a lot more words in the page in a smaller picture. And oftentimes you can see those text features that were, they'll have headings and other features that we've taught them to use to help it aid their comprehension. And again, the similar forms of we track their oral reading. In this case, in second grade, they actually read half out loud and half silently because they're really also building that stamina of reading silently. And we're able to keep track of, again, their reading rate, fluency score, accuracy rate with this assessment. And then we have that comprehension conversation. And in second grade, we actually add a third dimension to comprehension where we wanna know, can they tell us what happens within the text? Can they think beyond the text? And then we also wanna know, can they analyze the text itself? Can they tell us those things like the main parts of the book? 
the headings, the subheadings, how did they help you? Can you find descriptive words? Can you use evidence and back up your thoughts? And then there's that writing component that we can capture too for second grade. So those are the assessments that we use. So all of those are done one-on-one? -on -one correct. Each student. That is correct. Yep. Um, next slide. Let me just get my notes. Make sure I'm the same place. So, since we have this assessment system, the benchmark assessment system, CSSU wide, it's a research based reading assessment that allows teachers to measure students' decoding skill, their fluency, their comprehension ability, and their writing related to, to reading. It is a one on one delivered assessment. And we administer it to all second graders at the end of the school year. We actually do first grade as well. This is just the data. Um, that we were showing for the end of second grade and the students who were at that text level, as I mentioned, which would be M at the end of second grade, and those were who, were who were below it, at or above, because oftentimes we have many who are above as well. So all of this foundational work that I've been talking about really builds to the third grade, what's now NECAP, will be S back. So I wanted to just give you a look ahead to the future so that you could see what an S back task for third grade might look like. So I put a link to one, you can click on that. It's just called Bessie is Caring. So they would read a text at the end of third grade that looks similar to this with no pictures really, might have a small picture. And they're gonna answer a prompt at the bottom on the assessment that would be something like this. The author shows that Bessie is a caring person, write a paragraph telling how Bessie is caring. Use specific details from the story to support your answer. Or, in a minute, I'll show you that you can go to a link and they actually have SBAC kind of practice tasks you can do. And a lot of those, because it's a computer-based assessment, you can actually click on the evidence in the passage that shows that she's caring. And so that's kind of the, you can see that down below they give you, if you want, I'll give you access to this um, presentation after we're finished. And um, they give you little sample responses of what an above the expectation response would be, an at, and a below, and so on and so forth. So you could see those and read some more about that. And I have a video for you. So I'm about to show you a video of kindergarten through second grade teachers and students at work learning. I collected the video footage with several thoughts in mind. I wanted to show how reading and spelling instruction progressed from kindergarten to second grade, from an emphasis on letter names and sounds in kindergarten to decoding in first grade, and then switch to more comprehension focused instruction in second grade. I also wanted to show students working individually and collectively since that's part of our mission. And I tried to show a variety of classrooms and settings at each grade level. I don't think this is a complete picture of spelling or reading instruction at our school, but I think that seeing the real students in action and the teachers at work, you'll get to see a beginning understanding of the richness and the complexity of learning that occurs in our school. And I was thinking that as you watch, you could take notes in your head or on your papers to answer these questions. What changes do you notice in reading or spelling from kindergarten to first to second? And where do you notice students learning actively and collaboratively? And what stood out or was remarkable to you? And I, <laughs> I did all this work myself in iMovie, so my editing skills are somewhat novice. So uh, I hope that, that you could tell if sometimes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Sometimes what's most important comes right at the end of the clip because I put lots of clips together because I tried to select the ones that showed um, in the best way students learning um, to the goals that I had mentioned to you. So go ahead, I'm going to turn Ready? off the light so you can see everybody. In. And we did try to get um, a number of teachers and obviously a lot of students, but because so many teachers unfortunately had other commitments for this evening, so hopefully you'll see some good... Uh, Triple K one two teachers in here. Ready? Yep. And then just hit full screen. And match it right to your alphabet. Four. It's just the first letter. That's right. Hey, look at me as soon as you're ready. Hey, here's the next one. Your letter sound is C. 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 Oh, you said the whole key card. That's nice. Go ahead and find that C and match it on your alphabet board. Okay, you're 
next one is this one. Uh. You uh uh. You uh uh. Nice job. Find it and match it. You want to try very ads. So today we are going to um. I'm going to read this book called Monster Cake to you, and it's written by Rebecca Dickens. Rats in the cake. Bats in the cake. Do you see the highlighter tape? Bats and bats. Yeah. Pages are kind of tricky to see. Lizards in the pan. Can you imagine? Baking a monster cake as quick as we can. Sprinkle it with bugs. Nice job. Spread on thick green frosting made from garden slugs. Nice job. Slugs and bugs. A big moth is in the pot. Again, okay, go ahead and write that. A big moth is in the pot. A big Just skipping through the forest? Yeah, hunting for a bunny. And then why is he behind this tree? To hide. To be quiet. And then he aims. And the bunny shows emotions. And they become friends. Yeah. Reader ready. Flea went up. I need to hear you. On the frog. Don't turn the page yet. Get a good word right here. Everybody with feelings. Yuck! Said Lee, a frog is wet. Ooh. I really only hear okay, myself. It's, 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 it's a point Dear Lindley, I have had a great weekend. I went on a long walk. Who put the hair on there? Two examples that show the problem is getting worse. 
Can you add a sentence down here that tells about what you just told me? The evidence that the problem is getting worse? Alright, there you go. John realized his fork turned to chocolate. I was gonna say, was it, I think it was his bed. Ready? We're going to spell there. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot. That's okay. It's almost done. Come on. Yeah. yeah that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> YouTube. It's because all of our devices are looking for the internet. <clears throat> Good question. <laughs> the anticipation. So what is the word? There. Just John figuring that out. Nathan. Rabbit hop do the snow. Okay. I think we're close enough that you can you can yeah hop out of it. Since we're not having any luck. I think we're good. Close enough. I'm gonna be back here, right? Yeah. Okay. She will never guess they are from me. There we go. Okay. Is this the right slide, Patty? Yep. So now Patty's going to talk about math. It's the conclusion of the literacy section. This will have a little bit. We will have questions at the end. So if you haven't asked, feel free to ask me at the end. So what we see here, and unfortunately John Madden, our math coordinator, could not be here tonight because he does have um, a class that he's taking. So this is a picture of a triple E student. They're making sense of more than, less than, or greater than and less than um, as they compare the number of students who are in school today and who are not in school today from their class. Yeah. So I'm going to go through this a little bit faster. These are the Common Core Standards. We're, so I wanted to show you how they develop from K1 to 2 and then what they look like in an assessment. So if we look at the kindergarten math standards there, um, if you take a look at the green squares called major clusters, those are the standards that focus on our number sets. So counting and cardinality, operations in algebraic thinking, and number and operations in base 10. Common Core standards really support um, numeracy. And so at the bottom, measurement and data and geometry are there, but they're in service of number sense or numeracy, understanding numeracy. So here's an assessment. We do an assessment. I have pulled out an assessment for October. So you can just see what children would be assessed on. And they do some observations, some small group work and then an interview and one written assessment at the end of their number corner checkup, 
which is a time that is about 20 to 30 minutes, I guess, <laughs> somewhere around that amount of time, that's outside of math, their regular math class, which would be closer to an hour. So they do get quite a bit of um, mathematics during the day. And then at the bottom, you'll see a typical question that they would be asked to complete or a problem they'd be asked to complete at the end of kindergarten. Here are those first grade Common Core standards. Again, the green boxes, which are the major focus. But now you'll see one of those is also in measurement and data. So they're going to measure lengths indirectly and by iterating length units. And so again, they're learning number sense just through the lens of measurement. And here, um, I did just want to highlight on that last one that students are expected by the end of first grade to be able to add and subtract within 20. And then a first grade assessment, again, that same observation. And now they have two written assessments that they need to do, as well as a small group interview. And again, in May, they'd be expected to solve the problem underneath the October box. In second grade, again, focusing on our major clusters there. And you can see that there's a few more in the measurement and data. Again, using that as a tool for number sense. And by the end of second grade, now they've got a pre-assessment and a post-assessment, as well as some work samples and two other written assessments. So we've really ramped up our level of expectation of our second grade students. And then the next slide will show you the, the second grade task. And if you just look for a second at the complexity of this second grade task, these students are being asked to compare and contrast length, Estimate and measure using a centimeter ruler as a tool. Know how to find the difference between two lengths and write a numeric equation. And then also look at the reading level there. So the Common Core has wisely ensured that we are also teaching how to read informational text, of which this would be an example of it. So students have a pretty high expectation of reading the question to be able to solve the mathematical problem. Just want to show you the eight mathematical practice standards. That's what's laid out in the Common Core. So where it says MP1, MP2, et cetera, those are the, the standards. And you can see habits of mind, um, reasoning, explaining, modeling, and using a tool, and seeing the structure and generalization within problems. And it was kind of fun to come in here and see that we have habits of mind and habits of interaction posters in our high school math room. And we use them from Tripoli e through our eighth grade. So what a great um, connection there. I think that's fabulous. We deliberately teach these um, to our students. And we spend a lot of time making sure that they are making sense of mathematics, they're justifying, and they're generalizing, which is the um, the gold standard, making sure that students can generalize their thinking. So now I'm going to show you, before we hit this, hopefully the bandwidth will work for this one, um, a video clip of Nancy Knackley's first grade class. It just worked out this way. I don't know why Nancy was in it twice. Um, listen while Nancy reminds students to use private reasoning time to build equity in her classroom. She has students doing a structured math talk, which is two students who are paired up in very purposeful, excuse me, a purposeful way so that they can talk about mathematics, because when we talk about math, we get smarter as mathematicians. And that they need to be ready to justify their answer. Justification leading to generalization, which again is the conceptual understanding of mathematics. And pay particular attention to the boy in the blue shirt, not this boy, but the one next to him in the blue shirt, um, he'll say something, and I'll just talk about it briefly when he's done, but it's a pretty short clip. Oh. This time, this is going to be a little different. Okay, so this time, nine is the same as how many reds plus how many whites. Okay, take a minute of private reasoning time. Think about how many Justify your 
there, what he was saying is that, um, that the little boy pressed his um, partner to say, what does that look like? So justifying your answer. And that is absolute evidence of what we want in our math classes when kids are holding other kids to task. <laughs> um, and just really briefly, these are the Common Core fluency expectations. They're, how fluent a child is in the ability to recall math facts. Um, they are for K to six, and if you look, you'll see that second and third grade expectations, second graders are expected to have memorized addition and subtraction facts for all their single digits by the end of the school year, and third graders all their single digits for products and quotients. That is definitely a more, a higher expectation than what we have experienced mm -hmm. to date. So um, this, again, is a, uh, a typical example of what SBAC, we believe, is going to be giving us for a, an assessment as we move into next year. Um, I'm going to give you a minute of private reasoning time to please do that problem. And I won't call you, call you, <laughs> but think of the caliber of how challenging this problem is for a third grade student. Not only do they have to be able to read it, but they have to understand calibration on a number line. They have to be able to compare all of those number lines, realize which ones couldn't be true and which ones might be true. And obviously, as you can see, there are more than one. There is one more than one answer. So this again, when we talk about ramping up expectations for students, now you know why our students and our teachers are so tired. Um, we're all working really hard, aren't we? <laughs> so again, as um, Jensa said, and we because of time, we won't go here. But these are two websites. If you're interested, you will get a copy of this presentation. And you can certainly go to the SBAC sites to see what problems look like. And I think it's Deb, maybe Deb and Nancy. I'm not sure exactly who. But we'll talk to the next two slides. They're just going to tell you a little bit about science. And the, um, they're doing some piloting of the Boston Museum of Science modules that we bought a couple of years ago, I think it was. So they've, wor they've used year. those, thank you, last, yeah, year. last year. So they've used those for grades one and two now. So um, I just wanted them to talk briefly about how that's going as well, so. Um, so we've been using, like Patty said, the uh, modulars from the Boston Museum of Science, and they're actually called Elementary is education, or engineering is education. No, elementary is engineering. engineering. Is elementary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Doc, I'm sorry, I'm so tired. <laughs> so we used two of those last year, and we did one. Um, we, yeah, we did three. one. We did three. three. Yeah. We did one on um, bridges, and we did um, another one looking at um, what would be a great color for juices. And so this fall, I took a webinar course. Um, which was with the authors of these modulars. And so they, it was called um, Moving Toward NGSS, so the Next Generation Science Standards. And so it was a great thing to see after having done some of the modules with Deb last year. And um, basically it was talking about engineering and how our, um, it's going to be changing for us. So uh, it was focused on practices in science and in engineering and how they're parallel and complementary now, but not identical. So it's uh, focusing, so the new NGSS is focusing on the science practice, which is 
questions about phenomena, and then the engineering practices, which are questions about a problem that needs to be solved. So really looking at the engineering, and it's kind of like science inquiry, but a little bit different. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about pretty much what we were teaching and just give you an idea of what that looks like. So um, the first unit we did last year was um, a unit based on the science concepts were um, liquids and solids. And so what they had to do was use their understanding of liquids and solids to become engineers. And they were, be in this particular case, they were becoming a chemical engineer. And so um, we went through the whole engineering design process and taught them that. And then they um, participated in some inquiry-based activities where they were given a recipe to make Play-Doh. And so they had to create the Play-Doh, and they had to take some data on that, and then they had to use that data to make an improved design for the Play-Doh. Um, so the whole process of this from beginning to end was really pretty amazing. When I first opened up this module, I was like, oh my gosh, are they ever going to be able to do this in first <laughs> and second grade? And I was so pleasantly surprised because by the end of the unit, they knew the en engineering design process better than I did. And so I could just ask them, I could say, um, you know, this engineer is doing this, what part of the process is it? And they were able to quickly and easily tell me what part of that process it was. Um, another really beautiful thing about this was that it was really pretty integrative. I mean, it was doing a lot of the things like collecting data and just being able to investigate and analyze that data. And so using that to create something new. So they got to see it through to the application process. And they were developing those skills that we know our school has been traditionally weak, not weak in, but not as strong in um, on kneecaps for science. Um, you know, a lot of those pieces of where they have to look at something and look at the data and make decisions about what that data means and, and how it's useful. Um, so I feel like this is a really great thing because we're starting to develop that in elementary school in the lower grades. Um, and so um, another really great thing about this was that by the end of the year, I, we had done three units. And the second in, in, uh, unit was on forces in motion. That was a science concept. And um, through that unit, they actually acted as civil engineers, and they created bridges. And so they had to learn about all of those parts. And then they had to take a bridge and create it. And then they had to improve upon that design to make a better bridge. So that process was used again. And then in the spring, we did a third unit, which they were agricultural engineers, and they actually created hand pollinators. And they improved upon that design. So one of the really bigger, when you think of the bigger picture of things, is you, we now have first and second graders who understand what engineering is. They understand how many different possibilities there could be for them in their lives as engineers. And they're learning all these other really wonderful skills in that process. So they're seeing how they're not just learning the science. They're seeing how it's useful to them and how they will use it when they're grown up and how they'll use it in their everyday lives. So um, I'm really excited about this. I know Nancy is really excited about these. And so this year, we're going to do two more units. And this one is catching the wind, designing windmills. So they're going to learn about air and weather. And they're going to be mechanical engineers. And so I'm really excited about that because my husband is a wind wind um, <laughs> power um, engineer himself. He does a lot with wind power and solar power. So I'm going to grab him and drag him in like I dragged Dave in last year for one of our <laughs> things yeah. to do his, his big thing on bike helmets, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, this is really what, what we're moving toward. Everybody's moving toward. And we're just kind of trying to pilot and get kind of in under it. But this is what's happening with the next, next generation science standards. So everybody's going to be doing this probably in a few years once we get some of this other stuff behind us and under our belts. And um, I'm just really excited about it because I think it's going to just integrate everything and just really, really give kids a really um, just exciting um, experience with science and engineering and technology and all of those things, um, mathematics. And just they're going to be able to see how it all comes together in real life. And I think what was cool is we got to share um, our like lab reports with yeah. a four or five team, and they had after they had shared some with our students. Right. And it was really great to watch them explaining to these older students exactly the process that they went through. Right. And that was another really surprising piece too, because when we created these journals for them to use, and when they went down to the fourth and fifth graders and were explaining things to them, I w we were listening in on conversations, and I was like, "Wow, they really got that," you know. So it was really, really neat to see. I do believe in there, there too. There's 
the hands-on piece is really it's so oh, it, it's, huge. It's, yeah, yeah. It brings in all types of learners. That's another strength. And right. There's, there's literacy integrated reading in there as right. well. Mm -hmm. There's content area reading, so yeah. it brings their reading comprehension skills to that science yeah. forefront too, which is really nice. Yeah. Each one of them starts with a um, a book, a story, and that's how you yeah. open the unit. Yeah. And it's a problem a book where they have to, you know, they talk about problem solving in the book. So it's terrific. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. And Any I questions? thought you'd love this last picture because it really is quite indicative of <laughs> a primary group. And they happen to be doing a Reader's Theater. Theater play. And uh, it's a play. And if you just look, I mean, the hole in the knee is just, <laughs> right. I, I don't know, it just drew me. And the girl with the sling. <laughs> it's just so picture perfect to me. You know? A little bit so, of everything anyway, up there. Those are, those are our students. So. Thank you. Norman Rockwell. That's exactly what I said, Dave. I said Norman would be proud. But do you have questions for us? So I, I've noted, has the, the rigor of first grade math totally changed in the last two years? <laughs> yes, it has. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah, kindergarten. Okay. I noticed that with Ted because of that. And I was really surprised. It's probably five or six years ago anyway, that a uh, bunch of the, I guess they were mostly eighth grade parents, got very excited about the algebra program and how we did that in the middle school. And so we had several meetings and a big forum. And you know, one of the things that Elaine said is that you know, we have to reorient the math program. And if we want the kids to be successful in algebra when they're in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, it has to start much lower mm -hmm. so that they are prepared by the time they get to middle school, which that sounds like that's mm -hmm. what it's you happy. guys are doing. Yeah. And you so. saw that strand of algebraic yeah. thinking, which yeah. is yeah. so important yeah. starting in kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. So was it just <coughs> me, or it seemed the jump from first to second grade was huge in it terms of the, of the complexity, um, which I don't remember that one. <laughs> 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 you know, ancient it history, really but it was big, interesting that yeah. it was. It yeah. seems such a big. A it big is leap. a big, a big leap. Yeah. And from second to third is another big leap. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're right. It's a lot added yeah. on quickly. See, I was paying attention. <laughs> I, was, I was reading the stuff. <laughs> We're not kidding. There's a reason why everyone's so tired. <laughs> Isn't there a big maturity jump also for children yeah. in those two grades? I mean, I Developers. certainly have seen it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. When you Huge. Move, when you go back from the end of second grade back to the beginning of first grade. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> I know these like, yeah. Well, yeah. first grade is really hard. <laughs> yeah, so it does, it matches developmentally with how they're yes. growing as a person. Yeah, they're ready. I think they're really anxious, eager mm -hmm. for it. Yep. Great. You have done a wonderful job. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Well Thank you. So, and we're Thank going to be doing, uh, later this <coughs> school year, we'll be doing basically the same thing for uh, three to five mm -hmm. and then six to eight. So right. this is the, the, the first right. evening. And if there's anything so. else you want for three to five, or obviously six to eight, just let us know. Yep. We thought we, we took, provided. We took the questions, Patty, and we tried to tailor it to what you had asked. So. But if and there's anything else you want, too, just so. let us know. So, okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Concert album. It was good. Good crowd. Were they rocking. Quick? They were rocking. <laughs> rocking the gym. All right, have fun. Take care. Thank you very much. All of you. I Thank appreciate Gretchen. it. Thanks, Gretchen. So uh, next up is um, uh, 5.0 reports to the board. 5.1 is the principal's report. So if you want to. <laughs> Don't turn it over, Russ. <laughs> At least you have color. Last night it was all black and white. Yeah. 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 Wow. The deluxe version. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll kind of go through this a little, a little quickly. Um, kneecaps did come to an end uh, after. Two hard weeks of working on kneecaps, our third through eighth graders are done with reading, writing, and math kneecaps. They will never take them again. 
And then beginning in the spring of 2015, we will have the SBAC assessments rolled out at that point in time. And our fourth and eighth graders will continue to take science kneecaps um, for, I think it's three years. Yeah, um, they, the, this um, spring. Mm -hmm. The SBAC uh, sort of computer-based national test is 2017. So we have three years this year. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, come on in and see Imagination Playground. There are those big blue blocks that Joplin James gets into our school. And um, Dave actually told me that we usually have them for about two or three weeks, I guess. And we can have them longer this year. So kids, kids can, can play with them as their heart's desire. Um, it is for students in triple E through grade three. And it's just, again, developmentally appropriate for them to create their own play environment. And we thank the PTO for a wonderful fall season of PTO grants. They gave away, back to teachers, almost $5,000 in um, things like ebooks for the library. And the Rec and Recs were the, um, the uh, red and white um, manipulative that they were using in Nancy Nackley's math class that Looked you like saw. An abacus. Looked, that that's, like that's what that is for the people who were at that meeting and were like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, Tripoli playground toys and some glockenspiels for music. I just wanted to say that, isn't it? It is. Glockenspiel. Did I say it right? Glockenspiel and yeah. and Rex. So um, the next four things are just highlights of things that have happened in the middle school. I, I think you can read about them. Um, you know, we had the robotics team. We had wretches and jabbers come in, something that Molly initiated last year that's really become, I think, a, con a continual part of our Skills for Life. Um, we did it in our Bullying and Harassment Unit with sixth graders, a really powerful conclusion to it. Um, our, our new music teacher, Kristen Bamberger, pulled together a special seventh grade field trip, so all the seventh graders went to see Step Africa as part of a world music unit. And then you got your pictures down there, did you recognize? No. 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 You could recognize the Cape of Australia the and Suez. Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just kind of a, a cool unit pulled together by David Southworth on the symphony team where those pictures were actually taken by our students who took control of a camera on the International Space Station. Oh, wow. Um, pretty, pretty cool, cool opportunity to put together Very by Sally cool. Ride Science. Very cool. Um, then a couple professional development notes. Um, Rachel Petraska, Ginger, um, school nurse Jocelyn and myself attended a really powerful training last um, Monday, Tuesday, um, which is... A, the Vermont has, through, through grant work, has pulled together a suicide prevention um, curriculum that we're going to be implementing, starting with our 8th graders and probably permanently implementing in our 7th grade Skills for Life curriculum. And it, I just have to share the opening of it because it was so powerful. Um, you know, it taught, the, the presenter came in and talked about it. You know, the Red Sox had just won the World Series, so a lot of you probably been to Fenway Park. So imagine yourself in Fenway, the crowd screaming, you've got all that energy, and then all of a sudden you're by yourself in Fenway Park. If Fenway has the capacity of 38,000 people, and that's how many people commit suicide in the United States every year. And the, the power of that, you know, that, that is, it's, it's just mind-numbing. And 12 young people in Vermont take their lives every year as well. And so what, what we realized and what, what came together and Rachel and Jocelyn, big movers in this, is we went looking at our protocols at school. We have a protocol for what to do if a, if a family member or a student were to commit suicide. We don't have a prevention protocol. And so that's what a lot of this work was. They've done a lot of research around that. What are the warning signs? We're going to be putting together a staff education piece that we'll be implementing this spring, which I, I think will really fill a gap for us. Something that you, you definitely don't want to be looking in hindsight going, if only we had. So, mm -hmm. really good work. And then our Skills for Life program is also um, our new student assistance. Um, counselor Amy Buckley has arranged for a cyber safety unit. So, and a specialist officer from the Burlington Police Department coming in talking to the students about cyber safety and then to be following up with a parent education piece. So, some good work happening there in health. Very good. And then our faculty was presented a PowerPoint on youth stress and anxiety. Rachel Petraska and Vicki Weideman and our psychologist Ginger McDonald put that together. And I know that 
Um, the faculty really appreciated the depth of knowledge that they learned from that, that presentation um, and asked some good questions and got immediate feedback on that, so that was great. And we just want to highlight, obviously you can see the events there, but um, as of November 2013, our enrollment is 770 students. Questions, questions, comments? Did you guys see the, um, the new Bill Smith numbers? Did, in, no. did that email go around to everybody? Yes. Uh, I got it. Yeah. Um, you know, basically, it, it was interesting. Um, he sort of acknowledged that um, some of the numbers he had been using were somewhat flawed um, for Shelburne, and I think Heinsberg also. That um, you know, basically, you know, he to to, to kind of project. He he uh, looks at births and then takes a factor of that and says, how many of these kids are going to end up in Shelburne Community School? And I think the factor he was using was like had been like 105 percent, and the actual reality for the last several years has been more like 115 percent. So mm -hmm. it said, you know, that would seem to indicate there are. Families, you know, more families moving into Shelburne to be in the school um, so that, you know, they come sometime after the kids are born. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, anyway, it, it, you know, our enrollment has been more or less flat for the last three or four years and is projected to stay more or less flat for the next several anyway. Um, so, you know, it's a, it, it's a good thing and also presents certain challenges uh, mm -hmm. as, as, we've, as we've talked about. But... Um, uh, so it's good to see those numbers and you know, kind of validate some of the things that we've been, been thinking. And um, Russ, do you know, I know you, uh, somebody handed you the, uh, I think Elaine today at CSSU board meeting handed you information about Harrington Village. Was there any indication in there that, that those are um, family really dwelling really units? It small print. I know. And I was having a difficult time reading, reading them. Okay. Um, you know, there, there's two things, and I, I don't want to get too deep into them tonight, but there are two um, things that have the potential to yeah. impact our enrollment. One is the Harbor Place yeah. uh, facility, and the other is the new Harrington Village as well. I mean, there, there are probably other developments going on around town, but yeah. it looked like, from what I could tell, that uh, Elaine gave me a lot of the Harrington Village is going to be um, senior housing, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and so obviously that doesn't <laughs> doesn't doesn't present a big problem. And, and and it looked like many of the units, if I if I read it correctly, are like one and two bedroom uh, units in in the Harrington Village. So you know it's not like they're going to load them up with families. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm not overly concerned about either of them at this point, but it's something that we have to be aware of and, and you know, kind of know what's going on. And, and uh, Alan and um, I think Megan and, you know, several people in the administration have been in touch with both organizations. I guess it's the same organization uh, that, yeah, that's behind the, these uh, facilities or these developments, whatever you want to call them. And so we are trying to make sure that we understand is, you know, is there going to be a sudden influx uh, of families and children that we need to make sure that we're prepared for. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so um, next, uh, the CSSU debrief. Um, <clears throat> I think, it, well, Tim came part way through and Dave was, uh, was there um, at the end. I don't know that either of you saw, or no, Tim, you saw the, um, uh, the common topic, which was uh, uh, Really, a very interesting presentation about how all the changing laws and things going on with uh, healthcare are, are going to uh, going to impact us, and uh, it's going to uh, uh, keep Bob and Cindy and you know I think those two probably more than anybody uh, you know going to really keep them on their toes for the next several years, uh, and, and it definitely has. Uh, implications for contract negotiations and um, uh, you know budget and, and all manner of things so uh, you know fortunately I think we've got very good people in the administration uh, so they'll be keeping their eye on that and keeping us informed so we so I, I think that was you know the, the probably the most interesting anything else you guys have from the CSSU meeting that uh, uh, oh, um, we did review um, audits um, 
that it's now, and, and I don't know if this was Act 173 or where it came from, but um, managing the audits and approving the audits is now a, a supervisory union function uh, as opposed to us having to vote to approve our own audit. It's all done at the SU level now. Uh, fortunately, the audit um, for all the, all, the, uh, all the schools, all the districts went very well. Uh, as they typically have in the past. And uh, the one piece which we added was, um, you know, th there is a mention of our fund balance being very healthy. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, VSBA conference debrief, Kathy? Very good conference. Um, I, would th <clears throat> I think there were more than 300 people there. It was called Achieving a World Class Education for Every Child. Um, I would say that there was particularly infor interesting information about um, budgets and about funding um, for budgets. Um, and the keynote speaker was a Nathan Levinson, Smarter Budgets, Smarter Schools. And he had some very provocative ideas about how to look at your schools um, and how to look at funding um, and funding going into the future. Um, I think we can talk about those things at uh, budget meetings. Um, there was also a very interesting workshop that I attended, which was uh, about engaging community support for your schools and what's going on with the schools. And that was particularly um, pointed out to me last night in our facilities committee meeting where we were lucky enough to have a handful of participants from the community. The particular workshop uh, talked about, a, it was a case study essentially, where they went out in order to um, drum up support from the community and they went into individual homes and had meetings in homes, in neighborhoods with people in order to inform them and be informed by the community. And they did get a lot of people who were speaking to and, and for and about the schools. <clears throat> so that was a kind of an eye opener and something that we may want to think about in the future for ourselves, how we can um, call out to the community and hold our meetings perhaps in different venues and at different times than what we do now. Okay. So I would say all in all, it was a very, very successful um, two days Good. and exhausting also. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because you know, you're not supposed to go out that first night. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Makes the second day tough. Right. Uh, next is uh, the uh, first quarter financial report, uh, which I can find it in here again. I think looked uh, looked positive. Yep, there we are. Um, so as of um, the end of the first quarter, uh, expenses are forecasted to be $131,000 under budget. Uh, revenues are forecasted to be $195,000 under budget. Uh, before adjustments for the uh, plan fund balance application of $165,000. Uh, so if all things hold steady for uh, the balance of the year. Uh, we would be projected to run a surplus of uh, 101,000 uh, in change versus budget. Um, I don't think there was really, um, actually I guess special ed revenue and expenses are down based on changes to student IEPs um, and that's the kind of thing that could, you know, change in a heartbeat. Um, you know, if somebody moves in, moves out, that sort of thing. Um, I don't think there's, you know, nothing significant, I think it's just, you know, dribs and drabs here and there. Um, food service is projecting a small surplus also, so any year we can do that is a, is a good year. So, uh, <clears throat> And I guess that's basically it for the, the first quarter financial management review. Uh, and then we are going to have a facilities report. Did you want me to do that, uh, Alan, or would you like to do that? To be honest, I was expecting you to do it, but I'm happy All right. to. No, no. I'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> We, okay, had yeah. a, we had a, a meeting um, last week, I think it was, and we met with uh, 
David Epstein, again, from 2X Cullen, and we were presented with numbers <clears throat> after a um, cost estimator had come in and met with David Kelly and David Epstein and yourself too, Alan? Yeah. Was it? Okay. Um, and they um, outlined a whole list of various um, items in the school that should be attended to that have been uh, more or less neglected, deferred maintenance, and we were presented with a number for those if we were choose to go with that. And um, shall I give the number? Um, no, okay. Um, because we're going to certainly work on Maybe that before that we, before, yes, before, before, before we present. Shock. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I think, Anything. you know, to be fair that um, it was more than just deferred maintenance. I mean, it was a That's combination true. of deferred maintenance and, and, and old wish list stuff. Yeah, as I yeah. Perceive it. Pro projects looking forward, projects that have come mm -hmm. out of the two, 2005 work. Right. And projects that either have health and safety things that, as we looked ahead, we figured at some point this issue is going to have to be dealt with in the next 10 to 15 years. That's mm -hmm. really the scope that we kind of took. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty comprehensive mm -hmm. look. And energy efficiency. Too. And mm -hmm. energy efficiency, right. So then we had a community forum last night yep. where um, we asked for input from the community, um, presented to them um, what uh, some, what the ideals were, are for the school, what, what the school is, is um, moving towards, and asked for input from the community. And I think we got some very good and different things than some of the things that we were thinking about also. So we now have to go back and process all of that. Okay. When, when will you want to report again, I guess is a, a good question. When, when do you think, um, you know, you'll have significant progress? I mean, we're not looking at a bond vote this March, obviously. No. Um, that, that's really a year and change out uh, that we would anticipate that. So what, what's the next step for when? We should I mean, make sure we have an agenda item. To I mean, I would think at the next meeting that we would want to talk about it. I mean, I think what we need to do as a board is discuss in terms of dollars what we would potentially be comfortable with or, you know, yeah. because there's certainly more needs than there are dollars. I think yes. is a fair, fair yes. assumption. So, I, you know, we need to get a... We don't want to get too deep and then, you know, okay. turn around and run because of the sticker shock. So I, I think what we need to figure out, and we're not going to do it here um, this evening, is to figure out, you know, kind of then what are the next steps? Um, what sort of recommendation should the committee be coming back to us with? And, and you know, when, when do you need to do that so that we'll be able to deliberate and decide on? Uh, on what that looks like so mm -hmm. uh, but I guess the question Russ would you prefer the committee to come back with um, a laundry list at X amount and say this is what we're looking for uh, or would you yes I, I think but, I think, uh, but do I you think, want to see the whole thing or do you want us to scrub it first and come back and think this is what I, we I, think will I fly. Think, I think the committee should come with a recommendation okay. uh, and, and you might have you know plan A, B, and C uh, that says, you know, if we wanted to, you know, I mean, we know the roof is part of it um, and, and is, you know, kind of a must-have, you know, so, so sort of, you know, what, what are some of the must-haves uh, just to make sure that the building doesn't collapse uh, or, you know, health and safety issues, as, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, um, and then what are some of the, you know, maybe the educational imperative pieces of it and, you know, find, find some way to... Um, you know, structure your recommendations that, you know, then as a full board, we would be able to say, okay, yes, this is what we want to take to the voters at, you know, whatever point in time, whether it's uh, perhaps next November, uh, November 2014, or whether it's all the way out to, to March of 2015. I'm not sure what, you know, what's going to make sense from that standpoint. But. I think we still have a good deal of work to do mm -hmm. um, with all of this. Um, and uh, to understand more about 
um, refining the numbers again as well. I'm, we, I don't know if we'll be ready by next uh, month, but we can well, give it a we, shot. We, we don't. We don't have a regular December meeting. All, all we have is budget, oh, all we have is budget meetings. All budget. Month. That's right. Uh, that's right. The next regular meeting we have may not be until it's either January it's or February. January. It's February. It's February. Yeah. February. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it would be by February. We're looking at yeah. that meeting. Yeah. And, oh, and, that, and just you know, kind of as I was thinking out loud, you know, when a budget uh, or when a bond vote might be, uh, you know, it's not going to be this March. Mm -hmm. um, but if we might do it in November, which I think they're actually un unlike the CBU bond vote where it was the only thing on the ballot in Shelburne, I think that there will be state elections and, and congressional elections and that sort of thing in November of 2014. Um, just thinking about, you know, interest rates are not going any lower. Uh, and, and in fact, they may, you know, they, they will be going up. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know how much of a difference November to March w might make. Uh, but we should at least kind of keep that in, in mind. Mm -hmm. would, would it make sense to, um, given that there's, you know, the next opportunity to really discuss this is going to be February, would it make sense to put something in the board corner or some kind of a public announcement insofar as we did have a public forum um, just to just get, you know, the community aware of it um, so it doesn't hit them out of the blue if we decide to do a bond vote in November, you know, at least we can we can let everybody know that you know we, we've put this on the table. I mean, with after what happened with Schedule 2.0, you know, we 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 might want to take that as a. Well, I will tell you that um, Alan has put up a wonderful website for the facilities committee Great. where people can go and read the meeting minutes, see recommendations, Terrific. all of that sort of thing. So but the idea of putting a link to that yep. in right. the board corner mm -hmm. that exactly. mentioning, mentioning it to, exactly. yeah, that's so a great can, idea. So can yeah. stay apprised of it. Well, so yep. that, that could lead us right into 6.1, communications board corner. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you feel that there's enough sometime within the next 30 days or so uh, to, you know, write a board corner that, you know, is new news. Well, do we want to write that without bringing it to the board and having the board review that information before we put, give it to the public? It depends on whether, you know, are, are, are we going to write one that's basically about the process, which you know, maybe has already been covered to some extent or, and, and, you know, that we've discussed in various board meetings um, because I don't think you, you've got enough to be specific at, right. at this point. So, you know, I think we can probably have some conversation in, in some of our budget meetings as you make progress about when's the appropriate time, uh, when, when you would have enough substantive information or when we've given it enough consideration yeah. To, uh, yeah. to do something with okay. that. So. It would seem like we should... You know, or, gonna, or try to get another community event. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe like you alluded to, Kathy, a different venue or something like that. Wow. But I mean, to try to really move forward with a, you know, 700 student school and we have representation from four parents mm -hmm. and a couple board members. Yeah. Um, so, it seems kind of. Well, we, we, will, we will have. Uh, several opportunities to get in front of the public between now and town meeting uh, that we might, might blend utilize blend. utilize those. One, one of the things that's not on the next meeting dates that we will need to decide on fairly soon is doing a public budget forum in January. Typically we have done those in the past unless we get snowed out. Uh, so that would be, you know, a time to consider it. Mm -hmm. uh, although, although, you know, we tend not to get big turnouts for those either, but, uh, but maybe if we're packaging two things, you know, two, hey, two, for, the price, two for the price of one, yeah. Um, you know, there's the January 21st budget hearing. Again, sometimes there's more people than other times at, at that. And what I don't know with that one, that's the joint meeting with the, uh, the town. And we alternate each year who goes first and who goes second. And I forget what we did last year. And so you know, we're not sure. Second this year. In the town meeting or in the da January January, 21st? we go second. Okay. Town, town meeting, meeting, we, we go, go first. first. So then arguably for that, we could, uh, you know, we could tack it on to that meeting 
um, and see who stays. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, you know, we can talk about this in, in our next couple of budget meetings and mm -hmm. get a better sense of where we want it to go. Um, and, unless you want to do a, you know, a series of coffee clatches in people's homes around uh, <laughs> around town, or you know, go over and have one at Wake Robin and uh, you know, mm -hmm. Shel Shelburne Bay, or Hold Court and uh, Village Wine and Coffee, or uh, you know, any of those. Well, we, have, we have some suggestions that... from one of the attendants last night, okay. as well as okay. gleaning the information from the SBA. So okay. we'll have to discuss it in our facilities committee. Yeah. See what how we can do that. So. Um, all right, so next. Well, just one other sure. yep. comment on yep. communication. You know, I, when we had the retreat, I remember you and Patty talking a lot about your, um, and I don't know what you call it, your faculty advisor, or whatever the group is. Program, the, council. program council. And then, you know, last night at the facilities meeting, you brought it up kind of the first kind of product, product coming out of that. It would just seem appropriate that that might be a board corner that I mean, when I first heard that, I thought I was pretty excited and said, "Wow, you know, this is really powerful." And hmm. you know, I don't think a lot of parents know about what's going on. They probably look at it as the Alan and Patty show. Yeah. But you know, yeah, I it's think. Spreading, so, do you yeah. want to do that for next week, or do you want to do it for the first? No, week I was thinking <laughs> something. I was thinking something coming from <laughs> the good. administration. Well, they, they, they'll they'll ghostwrite it with you. Uh, yeah, but, this is uh, supposed to come from the board. That's right. Okay. It's not, well, it's not the principal's. It's not the principal's corner. It's it's the board's. Well, corner, maybe there so. should be a principal. I just think it's really good <laughs> stuff. I mean, <laughs> now we're changing. No, if you're if you're willing, Tim, I, I think it's a great idea. Well, I, guess, um, I mean, if it has you know, to be you, me, if then you, if you can work with these guys yeah, I, and and pick yeah. a date, just you know, don't yeah. do it Thanksgiving week. Yeah. Because yeah. um, no, I, I will format. take that as a yeah. yeah. There you go. Interview format. Tim. Interview yeah. format. T W and A M and P V. Right. <laughs> I like the ghostwriter idea better. <laughs> <laughs> Stamp it for us. That's absolutely. <laughs> I have a signature stamp. I'll just drop it off. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll go to 6.2 discussion of fund balance. Um, we had a little bit of email back and forth today, nothing that would violate open meeting law, um, but just about our application of fund balance and how that works, and I think it's especially appropriate. Um, as we've been talking about uh, the audit and as we talk about a possible uh, you know, future bond vote and that sort of thing. Uh, once the money goes in the fund balance, it, the only way it comes out of the fund balance is to ask the voters to approve it. So every year for the last, I don't know, four or five years anyway, um, you know, we've had an article that is asking the, the town or the voters to approve taking X number of dollars, in, in the case this year it was $165,000, to apply that from the fund balance to the revenue for the year that effectively helps buy down the tax rate. And, and we've been fortunate to have run positive variances most of the last, however, you know, again, probably four or five years anyway, so that despite our best efforts, um, and thanks to our administration and faculty and staff and everything, that fund balance has remained uh, at a level that the auditors like around 3%, and we're probably more like 5 in terms of our fund balance. So anything, though, that we might do with it, whether it is applying it to buying down, buying down the tax rate or, um, you know, one, one thought I had is, you know, maybe use it uh, so that we're issuing a smaller bond uh, that we might ask voters to approve 100 grand, 200 grand, whatever the, no whatever the number is. Uh, but that's the only way you get money out of there, is to have an article and to have the voters approve it. Um, and so, you know, I, I do like the idea of using some piece of it to, um, you know, whatever it is that might be part of the, the deferred maintenance or, you know, whatever we're looking at um, in an attempt to buy it down because it, the concern that we've had in the past and, and you know, we, we haven't said, well, let's use 300 grand of this to buy down the tax rate because the next year you're not going to be able to use 300 grand again and suddenly you're gonna, your, your tax rate's gonna spike, or the increase is gonna spike. Uh, so that's you know, one of the kind of strategic reasons, I guess, why we've been hesitant to you know, try to 
spend that down in one year, uh, it, it, you know, and really what we're doing is, as we should, returning it to the taxpayers, but doing that, you know, instead of bonding more is another way of doing it that doesn't kind of play some funky numbers with our budget and our, and our tax rate, so. Um, well, what happens if you overspend? I mean, we've had the luxury of underspending our budget. What happens if you overspend it? I think we've got to go to the voters and ask them to cover it. So you cover it with <laughs> yeah. the fund balance? So you can deficit spend and then go. So then you have to cover that. We'll cover it. Right. But, but I don't think it's an automatic just deficit okay. spend and write checks out of the fund balance to cover it. I, I don't. Fortunately, we've never had that problem since I've been on the board. Uh, but I don't think it's, you know, it's not like overdraft checking privileges or <laughs> anything, <laughs> like, anything like that. It, it's still, you know, having to, having to seek voter approval to, to use that money. Okay. Um, so the next uh, was action matters. And this one, there was, uh, I, I think the wrong thing ended up in the packet. It, it was uh, um, information about the baseline budget and the assumptions. But the budget, uh, the action matter that we were asked to approve tonight uh, so that we can move forward with the CSSU budget planning is purchase services. And we did review that at the last meeting. There was that nice grid that shows all of the things that uh, Shelburne, Shelburne currently purchases from the supervisor union, all the various services, uh, which I don't remember all, what all of those things were. But, you know, transportation is one of them, um, you know, various things. Um, now it's going to be um, special ed is, is part of that. Um, and, and, you know, the bottom line with any of it is if we don't buy it from the SU, we've got to go find another place to buy it, which is not going to be very efficient, and the administrators will not be very happy with us. Uh, so I, I don't, you know, I, the, the conversation last time and what was in the minutes is that it seemed to be, you know, pretty much a, a consensus. Nobody had any real issues with, you know, sticking what we've done. So, um what I'd like to do is to get a motion to approve, uh, you know, continuation of the purchase services as we did last year. Um, so if I could get a motion to, and, and, and as we discussed at the last meeting, if I could get a motion on that. So right. moved. And do we have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, the consent agenda is uh, just the, approving the minutes from uh, last time and approving the director's order. So if I could get a motion on that. So moved. And do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so next is just confirming uh, our next meeting dates. Uh, our first budget meeting on November 20th. Um, December 4th, that's the one I, I, I had emailed and I think uh, Alan sent something around. Uh, looking to change that. Um, there is a conference down at Harvard, uh, did yes. I do the accent right? Um, that uh, I think Patty, Allen, and John, our special ed director, have been invited to um, so that we would want to change that, that budget meeting. Was it the 15th that you had recommended? Was that the? Wednesday the 18th. The 18th. So just kind of pushing. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second meeting would be effectively the 11th, and the third meeting would be yeah. the 18th. Okay, and so uh, Bob Mason was good with that, and we said he's kind of one of the critical people he's, that yep. needs he's to do that. It would be at 7.30 a.m. like our same others? Same time, same yeah. place. Okay. okay. So and that would be November 20th, December 11th, and December 18th, is that correct? Yeah. Yep. So does anybody have any issues with, uh, with that? None here. Okay. Great, thank um, you. So I'll... Um, or actually, I think Sandy has an email list at this point of everybody, all our budget buddies. So I'll, I'll ask Sandy to send an email out to everybody Great. to, to confirm you. that date. And, you know, there may be some people who can't make it. Hopefully everybody can, but uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think we'll have enough, yeah. enough of everybody there. Um, so then we'll have a uh, budget meeting on January 8th. Um, sometime in one of our next budget meetings, we'll figure out a budget forum evening. And then we've got the joint meeting on the 21st. There's a CSSU meeting next um, on the 20th, which I think is Wednesday. Um, yep. And that's going to be here at 5.30. So, um, 5.30 is an executive session, and 6 o'clock is when the meeting is Thank you, start. yes. Um, yeah, I think it's the 5.30 is executive session to uh, discuss negotiations again. Uh, so speaking of executive session and negotiations, um, 
I'd like to get a motion to uh, go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations, a legal matter, and a personnel matter. Second. All in favor? Aye. And what we will do, uh, because one of these will require a vote, will come out of executive session, uh, make the vote in public session, and, uh, and then we'll adjourn. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So Sandy doesn't have to watch the whole tape. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the consent agenda. Who, who? Uh, I seconded was, that. Uh, you seconded. Who yeah. firsted? I think I firsted. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 we'll enough. be checking yeah. on, our, <laughs> yeah. on the grammar. Yeah. Okay. Thank so. you. Anything else? All right. So we're uh, we're out of here, and I guess we need to go find a room for executive session. And so. you're supposed to go.